The title of the paper was uh, Dr. Dilettante, Fact and Fiction in Ron Paul's Revolution. And the real purpose of the paper is to compare elements of Ron Paul's revolution largely within his followers, not necessarily his campaign itself, although I do touch on that to some extent, um, but largely the, the correlation between Ron Paul's movement and uh, the narrative from Ayn Rand's dystopic novels. So I um, hope you enjoy it, and here we go. This paper examines the ways in which Ron Paul's political campaign and supporters use economic, political, and biographical facts to reinforce Paul's maverick intellectual esteem, reminiscent of objectivist protagonists in Ayn Rand's dystopias. Thus construed, facts become so agenda-laden that, in many respects, the Ron Paul narrative resembles that of a fictional hero. Fiction and fact have a complementary relationship for Ayn Rand. Ayn Rand adopts the model of a hero as the embodiment of an admirer's ideal principles, which the admirer has not or cannot actualize themselves. Um, when the ideal lies beyond the actual capacity of a hero, such as those originating from legends and myths and other types of fiction, the admirer may in fact superimpose the ideal onto the real hero. Heroes who have possess who, who possess the best ability in their respective fields or towards their specific purposes are unique. They are the sole victors in the achievement of human potential in a given area. Although an unwavering atheist, Rand comfortably used religious language and themes to describe such heroes, conceiving God and spirit, for example, as expressing the maximization of talent, creativity, and productivity. Her biography and her philosophies of aesthetics and fiction are conducive to the worshipful veneration both of real and imaginary heroes. But fictional and factual heroes can lend their attributes to one another, prompting admirers to endow a real leader with legendary traits, and thus dubbing the leader uniquely qualified for such a role, a confluence and singularity often seen in Amer American politics and manifest recently in the culture of support for the presidential campaign of Congressman Ron Paul. The gap between ideal and actual, between hero and admirer, between deity and devotee, thus respects a disparity in knowledge or skill, resulting in the attribution of some exclusive talent to the hero often labeled charisma or mystique. Rand regularly entices readers with mystique as a literary device, mostly, most famously through John Galt, the paragon of her objectivist schema, who dominates her pinnacle opus, Atlas Shrugged. The elusive John Galt is Rand's um, prototype hero. Although Galt is a man who talks straight, in quotes, he sometimes give no, gives no response when interrogated, exercising his autonomy and right not to obey. This is in some respects reminiscent of uh, Christ's uh, coming before Pilate, um, which I, is more of what I would, would have mentioned if I had uh, less time constraint at the conference. Galt had, quote, the look of a ruthless innocence which would not seek forgiveness or grant it." Unquote. He is the fantastic mastermind behind a broad strike whereby society's greatest minds abscond to a secret location, having grown weary of increased leeching, mooching, and looting by the weak and unproductive. It is evident that Paul, Ron Paul, is versed in and thinks to some degree in the narrative terms of the dystopian genre. He sometimes compares expansions in government oversight of private lives to those of Jeremiah, such as Huxley's A Brave New World and Orwell's 1984. Ayn Rand's work seems especially to have influenced Ron Paul. He astutely read the Ayn Rand objectivist newsletter in the 1960s and 70s, and knew personally a number of economists and political activists who were corresponded with Rand and admired her work. Both Paul and Rand credit Ludwig von Mises, the Austrian-style free-market economist, with profound influence on their thought. Among Mises' most emphatic arguments was that government intervention in currencies and markets occludes the real value of goods and commodities such that true prices could not be calculated, which Rand duplicated structurally to say that under altruism, no moral calculations are possible. Rand's influence on Paul and his followers is no surprise given that her literature Quote, is still devoured by eager, eager young conservatives, cited by political candidates, and promoted by corporate tycoons, unquote. Although Rand may have been the most contemporary philosophical influence on Paul, and her novels appear regularly in his recommended reading lists, 
He rarely mentions her in his literature, preferring instead to reinforce his libertarian sentiments with the words of founding fathers, national heroes, and, of course, respected political leaders. He may also distance himself from direct reference to Ayn Rand because of, quote, strong disagreements with her on important matters, which you know, presumably uh, having to do with his belief in God and Christian faith, which Ayn Rand would have um, rejected and did. Nevertheless, her narrative fingerprints speckle Paul's political philosophy and rhetoric. He echoes Rand's view that individuals should be liberated, quote, as rational beings trying to achieve, achieve our goals through reason and persuasion rather than threats and coercion, unquote. This view of human beings, quote, is the primary moral reason for opposing government intrusions into our lives. Government is force, not reason, says Ron Paul, or writes Ron Paul. Similarly, Ayn Rand articulated through John Galt that, quote, force and mind are opposites. Morality ends where a gun begins, unquote. Rand saw little difference between the conservatives and liberals of American politics, as they both used the government to impose their will on the individual, conservatives in lifestyle and liberals in finance, and both used some form of collectivism as justification. Thus, Republicans and Democrats alike are in danger of magnifying bureaucracy to levels resembling the Soviet Union. Ron Paul echoes this comparison uh, of Ayn Rand's on multiple occasions. Uh, in, in, in a block quote, he writes, the reason these last five years, or actually he says in a speech, the reason these last five years have been successful has been the recognition that our system is falling apart, just like the communist system fell apart. That was the biggest news of the 20th century, the failure of communism, because it was a bad idea. And of course, when he's talking about the last five years being successful, he's referring to his own uh, movement. At one point in Atlas Shrugged, John Galt is directed to a stack of petitions and letters from children religious leaders, mothers, the disabled, begging Galt and the government for help. However, they failed to persuade or even to emotionally budge Galt, who recalls Hank Reardon, a business, businessman who was victimized by the looters. Galt declines to, quote, follow their blindness and points to the irony of helping those who admire his intelligence, quote, by dropping my intelligence. Likewise, Ron Paul opposes this soi-disant Robin Hood ethic of tapping the wealth of the rich to assist the impoverished. Theft as a means is not justified by its end, and in fact, Paul calls into question whether that end, a government handout, is at all positive in the first place. A photo circulating the web shows Ron Paul at a desk with a sign that reads, Don't still steal. The government hates competition. In his The Revolution, a manifesto, he bemoans governmental, quote, looting of Americans, and refers to the assistance programs as, quote, the distribution of loot. Income tax is loot because, in comparison to the military draft, it imposes governmental ownership of citizens' productivity in the same way the military draft expresses the ownership of citizens' bodies. Paul uses the Randian term loot and looting on several more occasions throughout the book. In Liberty Defined, Rand's dichotomous vocabulary is even more salient. The justly rich are being looted, Organized thugs, quote, distributed, or distributed, quote, the loot, looted wealth of the country, a habit which undermines the creative genius of free minds, and consequentially, the producers are rebelling, unquote, alluding perhaps to the actualization of the plot of Atlas Shrugged, the mind on strike. Paul's unwavering audacity to oppose perceived established norms also often isolates him from his colleagues, both on the left and on the right. Um, and he, he, he writes, we are dangerous to the status quo of this country. Uh, in the words of supporter Robin Kerner, Paul's primacy of liberty is, quote, is a philosophical one. It precedes politics, and that is why it allows Paul to transcend the bankrupt left-right paradigm. Indeed, Ron Paul's unique consistency, maverick enthusiasm, and rebellious demeanor has roused the libertarian base and inspired what has truly become a revolution. All right, mystique among Ron Paul supporters. Uh, it is no challenge to locate panegyrics among Ron Paul supporters. Uh, from only one post on the Daily Paul, for example, just as a few minor examples, one of the most popular supporter websites, user comments exalt him as a national hero. Ron Paul is, quote, the greatest American since Thomas Jefferson. Paul's birthday, quote, should be a national holiday, uh, Liberty Day. And most graphically, a comment, Dr. Ron Paul will go down in history as the man that started the movement that restored the Constitution. He deserves a place on Mount Rushmore 
next to our founding fathers. Of course, I hasten to add that it's worth mentioning that not all of the um, people represented on Mount Rushmore are founding fathers. Uh, other supporters venerate him almost as a messianic figure. One supporter writes that God sent us a blessing 77 years ago. It's on his 77th birthday. God smiles on his gift to the world. Will this wicked world reject his gift? And more mystically, the luminance of liberty has shown bright for 77 years. Those from his, uh, his birthday messages on the Daily Paul. With slogans like, Restore America Now, Paul is also viewed as the vanguard who will return America to an idealized, pristine, revolutionary past. Supporters have even circulated a two-tone effigy of Ron Paul's face, stylized like that of Obama in 2008, and, with perfect irony, that of Che Guevara decades earlier. One might also find, one also finds among Paul's supporters, Randian intellectual principles undergirding the emotional components of the movement, such as Rand's egoist formulation of love. The Ron Paul campaign adopted an image of the word revolution that frames the reverse word love within it, originally designed by libertarian uh, Ernie Hancock in reference, reference to the love of liberty. With similar justification to Ayn Rand's account of love and personal autonomy, one supporter interprets, Love says to his object as you wish, and a Paul presidency would say to its citizens just that. It's not government's job to decide for you. Your life should be as you wish. Now that is true free love 2012 style. End of quote. Another supporter has even compared the libertarian love revolution against American imperialism to that of Gandhi's civil disobedience of the British. All right, uh, the next section, uh, Constructing Mystique, Rand's Heroism and Ron Paul's Revolution. Uh, it is now our task to explore some of the ways in which Randian fictional narrative and Ron Paul's presidential campaign have together constructed Paul's mystique as a revolutionary leader. They may be identified as... I'm, roughly in these three categories, intellect, reduction, and prediction. All right. The intellectual force of mystique often persuades followers to accept their leader as an authority over most or all other relevant areas in which he may exhibit little, little or no competence or mastery. Observe talent in one field, it is assumed, implies talent in several. Rand's literature reinforces this conjunction. Her objectivist philosophy reduces all forms of intelligence to rationality, understood strictly as the ability to mediate all thoughts and impressions through a dispassionate and impartial, logically deductive filter. Check your premises is a recurring maxim in Atlas Shrugged. For Rand, all genuine talent stems from reason, which is universally applicable. Since demonstrably authentic skill in one area evinces a rationally actualized core, it therefore endows one with the capacity to easily master talents in other areas. We find one illustration of this leap in Atlas Shrugged, um, in the character from Atlas Shrugged, Calvin Atwood, who abandons his power company to become a cobbler in John Galt's individualist haven. The hero thereby becomes the filter by which followers interpret everything else, the meta-narrative under which all narratives are subsumed, reduced and defined, such that even if the hero's analysis in a peripheral subject is demonstrably weak or flawed or irresponsible, it is nevertheless trusted, if only for the sake of simplicity or centralization. Sufficient for influence, then, is not the actual possession of broad knowledge or inf insight, but the impression of it to disciples and prospective followers. But often enough, grandmasters in chess are poor mathematicians, Brilliant scientists are sophomoric philosophers, and often enough, eloquent politicians, deficient economists. Knowledge of history, economics, and libertarian rhetoric in, uh, in Ron Paul. How does Ron Paul fulfill this, um, this uh, intellectual mystique? The doctoral imagery especially conjures uh, several intellectual images. Ron Paul's full name and title, Dr. Ron Ernest Paul, depict for many supporters an idealized, honest, intellectual hero. Publisher Robin Kerner, again, uh, writes, and I quote, If one were to score American politics on integrity, philosophical understanding of humanity, humanity and governance, and understanding of economics by looking at their speeches, votes, books, and predictions, Paul would be among America's very best, unquote. British historian Tim Stanley recalls Paul's, quote, rapid-fire straight-talking, which detoured into scholarly, scholarly pot shots at the American-Philippine War of 1899 and John Maynard Keynes." Unquote. 
Denoting his professional history as a medical doctor, Paul's title elicits Im imagery of a benevolent physician, not merely for the health of individuals, but for America, through his restoration of its true fundamental value, liberty. One viral cartoon portrays Paul in scrubs coddling a newborn swaddled in an American flag, presumably representing our delicate and distressed economy. Although expertise in economics is expected of no typical politician, Paul gives the image and encourages the reputation of his own expertise. In this case, his mastery of libertarian rhetoric and association with renowned economists prompts followers to accept the claim of his skill in their field, accepting his argument that, quote, sound money is equivalent and is necessary to have a free society, unquote. Paul considers fiscal policy the primary means by which government either protects or sabotages the personal freedom of its citizens. Hence, his most emphatic positions are economic. But despite his strong convictions, Paul lacks a formal background in economics, through which he would have crunched numbers, performed statistical modeling and analysis, and certainly would have encountered many more theoretical perspectives on their own terms rather than as coarsely described through the laissez-faire lens of the Austrian school to which he is so deeply wed. That is, with true expertise in economics, he likely would now entertain more nuanced and sophisticated positions. Paul indicts the Fed for many economic challenges as well, such that he claims that ending the Fed, well, this is a part of my uh, thesis, which uh, I skipped uh, because of uh, time constraints, but his, uh, essentially this paragraph would have uh, uh, referred to his, uh, Paul's description in End the Fed, where he attributes uh, to the Fed many of society's economic woes and argues that ending the Fed would bring an end to, uh, for example, the business cycle and many other uh, difficulties that we're encountering now. Um, it, problems that existed before the Fed existed. And, and problems that are therefore not likely to go away once the Fed is dismantled. However, Paul wants to make this argument that the Fed is um, uh, is causing all of these problems. It's actually a fairly naive view when one pits it against many other views of uh, of leading economists and also uh, just um, uh, well, uh, just put it bluntly, but reason right. Considering that uh, it's clear that the problems existed outside of the influence of the Fed. All right, enough of that. Okay, um, next category, uh, area where Paul builds up his mystique, reduction and or generalization, the genius of simple solutions. Okay, reduction. Much of Paul's rhetorical strength comes from his reduction of all issues to matters of personal liberty. He replaces individual freedom at the core, or he places individual freedom at the core of his agenda and thus channels all other issues through that priority. For Paul, quote, the goal of all political action should be the preservation of liberty. Above all, the theme is liberty. The goal is liberty. The results of liberty are all the things we love, none of which can be fina finally provided by the government." End of quote. He also has said in an interview, I'm always campaigning. I've been campaigning for 34 years for my favorite subject, and that is personal liberty. That is my goal. End of quote. Paul links every economic problem to some violation of personal liberty so that the solution, every time, is the contraction of government and the expansion of self-determination. Liberty is thus Paul's panacea for the nation's financial turmoil, such that anything augmenting personal autonomy benefits everyone collectively. But it is precisely this talent of suppositional imagination, admired by his mystified supporters, that blurs the distinction between fact and fiction. Ron Paul's libertarian claim that maximal personal liberty and minimal government oversight resolves all fiscal problems remains highly suspect. Paul either dismisses or ignores well-known deficits or defects of laissez-faire economics, such as advantages for people who enter the market with inherited privilege and resources, and thus disadvantage for those who do not, or the fortification of such pre-existing disparities into a systematic and persistent imbalance in the effort required for an individual to pursue wealth. Paul wishes to allow everybody to freely acquire and hold capital, but forgets that once resources are earned, they can be used to encumber competitors, who will thus experience greater difficulty than the first, ceteris paribus, thereby frequent, freely exercising one's liberty to the often accidental and indirect suppression of another's, sometimes intentional and direct. Deregulation forfeits the government's ability to prevent or control exploitation, 
nepotism, price manipulation, hegemonic mon monopolies, and numerous other blights of unfettered capitalism. Nevertheless, Ron Paul argues that maximizing personal freedom by minimizing and in many cases eliminating government oversight over the economy will enhance prosperity. Uh, free enterprise will expand, the middle class will grow, the nation's GDP will climb, its currency will stabilize, the business will, th business will thrive. Um, simplify, reduce, filter, label, uh, totalizing, uh, more easily captivating the control and controlling the minds, uh, controlling, controlling the narrative. And uh, I, uh, I didn't actually continue this part of the paper. I think I skipped it in the, pre in the presentation. Okay, uh, third category, prediction and fulfillment. Uh, Jack Cafferty credits Paul with uh, a lot of econo economic clairvoyance in his video or in his discretion, discussion of, uh, of, of Ron Paul's success. Uh, Ron Paul's predictive ability, and it's in a block quote. He, say, he, he says, when Ron Paul ran for a Republican nomination in 2008, he talked about the economy imploding, the untenable nature of the national debt, the eventual discretion, destruction of our currency, and the limited role of government. In the four years since then, a lot of the things Ron Paul warned us about have happened. We're deeper in debt, a lot deeper. The dollar is worth a bit less, quite a bit less. The country is more divided maybe than at any time since the Civil War. This is Jack Cafferty. A hypothetical uh, 2030 economics lecture in Beijing uh, also appears in a Ron Paul ad, which apparently was never aired, uh, and it has a Chinese lecturer uh, answering questions or, discuss, or teaching a class, and part of the narrative is he says, why, does it, why did the economy of America fail? They made a big mistake, turning their back on the principles that made them great. America tried to spend and tax itself out of a great recession. Enormous so-called stimulus spending, massive, uh, massive changes to health care, supporting the same bad politicians and crushing debt. In 2012, a man named Ron Paul ran for president. For over 30 years, Ron Paul tried to stop the collapse of this country, but the media ignored him. Of course, we owned most of their debt, and they never recovered from that mess. Now their money is as good as toilet paper. This is this um, hypothetical Chinese lecturer in 2030. Um, so again, the idea that uh, Ron Paul and his movement uh, can anticipate what will happen to the economy and have done in the past. So this gives them additional credibility and also gives them some uh, mystique uh, for their uncanny ability to, uh, it is said, predict the economic future, financial future of the United States. Uh, the mystique is reinforced in as much as Ron Paul's struggle within a corrupt system uh, resembles several recurring themes in Ayn Rand's fictional narrative. Um, and quote from one supporter, Don, Dr. Ron Paul, or Dr. Paul is a man far too good for politics, unquote. He is portrayed as an emblem of virtue within a miasma of corruption. Ron Paul's supporters see the same machinations within both major parties as Rand did in the looters. But Libertarian's primary target was the Republican National Committee because the party nomination was, of necessity, the campaign's first goal. Elite members of the RNC were perceived to sabotage Paul's candidacy in a number of ways. This is a, a what I'm describing here is how the uh, the culmination of Ron Paul's campaign and the, um, the the clash between the campaign and the Republican National Committee and the convention um, really did seem to uh, to embody some of the conflicts described in Ayn Rand's uh, novels, where it's a kind of a fight the system sort of scenario, and uh, and Ron Paul's movement uh, were certainly uh, members of the movement were certainly trying to fight the system. But the system still resisted eventually uh, because they had the power uh, corrupted through the the force of government they ended up winning the day uh, and of course that was anticipated in Rand's literature and of course in many of Ron Paul's followers um, all right uh, Rachel Maddow remarked that quote the Republican establishment improperly helped Mitt Romney in his fight to win the nomination a supporter William Lewis noted that the Republican Party quote, tried to blackball Ron Paul by excluding Paul from the New Hampshire pri Republican primary discussions, even though his poll numbers were higher, and others indeed were, in, were included. Uh, there was complaint about the layout of the ballot in Nebra the Nebraska convention. Delegate candidates supporting Romney's agenda were clearly designated as such, while other candidates were not, etc. Uh, the media also stood as uh, top-down uh, bureaucratic juggernauts aiming to sabotage the Ron Paul revolution. As Comedy Central's The Daily Show famously demonstrated at the beginning of the primary season, Ron Paul nearly won the August 2011 Iowa straw poll, but his success was largely ignored by many mainstream media pundits on MSNBC's Meet the Press, CBS's Face the Nation, 
Fox News Channel's Fox News Sunday. The CNN anchor uh, Drew Griffin notoriously told his correspondent, if you get video of Sarah Palin or get a soundbite from her, bring that to us. You can hold the Ron Paul stuff. Some uh, Ron Paul supporters expressed disappointment that, uh, given the quote, given the media's near blackout, we may never know unquote, whether Ron Paul could rally more support than his GOP opponents or the effects of a Ron Paul presidency on the economy, foreign policy, and every other political matter. Similar to the unknown real value of goods and commodities due to the price fixing and currency manipulation, we cannot know the real influence Paul would have had with fair media treatment, another permanent mystery supplementing the mystique of the Ron Paul revolution. Ron Paul recommends the consideration of historian Carol Quigley's attribution of some political developments and reform to clandestine influence, in some of which he claims to have had a role. Paul summarizes Quigley's thesis. There is tragedy if you don't accept this, if you don't accept the idea that there are people pulling strings behind the scenes. And there is hope if you know who runs the show. Uh, end of quote. He closed his, uh, Ron Paul closed his campaign with the reassurance that, and I quote, not winning every single battle is irrelevant if you can win the war. And the real war is the war of ideas, and that is where we are having our greatest success, end of quote. Indeed, given the tangled relationship between Ron Paul's revolution and Ayn Rand's prognostications, there is much to be considered regarding the extent to which these ideas represent fact or fiction. Thanks very much. That's the end of the presentation. Um, I hope you found it helpful. I hope I didn't read through it too quickly, uh, but part of it is just because it, it's it's fairly lengthy, um, and uh, there need there are gaps that need to be filled in. And uh, I, I am of course working this up into an article, which should be uh, hopefully hopefully published. Um, there are a couple of possibilities for the peer review journals that I want to submit this to. Um, but yeah, I'll keep people updated on, on Facebook and other social, social, social media um, as time progresses. But I should, I, I should have the article finished, developed from this, um, in November, uh, so next month. Uh, but I, I look forward to any dialogue that emerges from this, this video. And um, I, again, parts of it are a bit choppy and need some work. But of course, I, uh, of course, of course I submit myself to your criticism. I really look forward to uh, some stimulating dialogue. Just to rehash, um, uh, to go back and um, I was arguing, I was arguing that uh, Ron Paul's mystique really has, uh, uh, or the the construction of Ron Paul's mystique among his supporters, has three primary elements. And those are uh, the mystique of his intellect, the mystique of his uh, reductive abilities to reduce all problems down to matters of personal liberty, and third, uh, the mystique associated with his ability to predict the financial future, uh, to make predictions, and Ayn Rand's predictions about um, the, the juggernaut of, uh, of government and its affiliation with business um, uh, combining to oppress people who are lovers of liberty, one might say. So again, intellect reduction, prediction, uh, kind of in a nutshell, how Ron Paul's mystique is built among his supporters, and also to some extent his own political campaign. Thanks very much. Um, Again, I look forward to your comments. Thank you. And uh, one day I'll learn how to turn off the camera. All right, take care. Thanks. Thanks for watching.